All right, so uh, we're here today with uh, Devin Spencer, who's one of our mentors. Uh, he joins us from Project OpenSea, and uh, he's going to give us uh, a talk today and school us on uh, building tradable assets uh, using OpenSea and what they're doing with uh, creating uh, these ERC-721 based uh, token economies. So uh, thanks for joining us, Devin, and uh, take it away. Thanks for having me, Adam. Um, so yeah, I'll start with a quick presentation, um, but I'll, I'll go through it pretty quickly so that we can get to uh, more of the hands-on, like sort of fiddling around with the SDK, um, that type of stuff. But for a quick overview, um, let's see. Oops. Yeah, so uh, overview on, on OpenSea. So OpenSea is a decentralized marketplace for uh, non-fungible tokens, which are things like CryptoKitties, um, things like blockchain gaming items, crypto collectibles, um, as well as things outside of crypto games, um, including uh, there are a few experiments with putting tickets on the blockchain. Um, so basically, you can think of it as a general eBay for, um, for digital assets. Uh, we are currently, we do uh, around half a million volume monthly. Uh, we'll, we'll be hitting that in March. Um, and, uh, you know, hundreds of, of different NFT projects have come online over the last year since CryptoKitties really sort of kicked off the space. Um, and our API, which I can, I'll talk a little bit about later, but it's basically a way of uh, getting collectible data powers a lot of the, the most well-known wallets, including uh, Coinbase Wallet, um, Trust Wallet, and Opera. Um, and basically our model is that um, there's a lot of games coming online that have digital assets, but don't necessarily have a way for users to trade them. So we provide both this general eBay style marketplace, but also uh, white labeled individual marketplaces for projects. Um, and then our uh, Backers are include Y Combinator, Founders Fund, Coinbase Ventures, uh, One Confirmation, and, and Blockchain Capital. Um, so this is just kind of a, a introductory example of um, why these kind of economies for NFTs can be pretty interesting. So here's this is a game called Ethereum on, um, which is kind of like Pokemon on the blockchain. Um, it was a game that was a very fast follow to CryptoKitties. So they had this, this game where you could um, buy these digital monsters and kind of play around with them. Um, and what was interesting was with a traditional game, they would sort of own the whole gaming experience, right? With Pokemon, um, you know, you, the company that creates Pokemon owns the assets, uh, they host it on their own servers, they build the UI, they build everything. Um, but with Ethereum on, what was interesting was the, the first kind of layer of unbundling was you obviously own these things on the blockchain in your wallet. So the authentication mechanism was actually through something like MetaMask, uh, Trust Wallet, or um, Vault, which is another wallet. The other interesting element of the game was they had an exchange, or they had a, a token um, called Emont, and that token actually is tradable on uh on relayers, right, or um, uh, token exchanges. So that kind of added an, a new element to the economy. And then where we stepped in was we were another marketplace where you could trade your Ethereum on items. And in fact, while the initial game had a marketplace for the um, monster items, they didn't have any marketplace for the uh, power-ups. And so we sort of became the, the place where people traded that. Um, they also added like scaling solutions so that added like another level of unbundling of the game. And then, um, then even later there were these sort of layer two games where you could use elements in the initial game to buy. Um, I think you could use the Emont token to buy assets in this partner game. And then those uh, partner game items are actually now one of our biggest trading assets on Open OpenSea. So point is, these, these economies can actually look very interesting over time. Um, they start as vertically integrated uh, economies, but over time they can actually become a lot more complex and interesting um, because of sort of the benefits of an open protocol for uh, exchange. 
Um, and yeah, here's an, here, those assets are actually also traded on OpenSea. So this is kind of an, op an overview of uh, what, what you can do on OpenSea. Um, so the first thing, is, the first important thing to understand is that the moment you have a non-fungible asset represented by the ERC-721 standard, which I imagine a lot of you guys are familiar with, but um, it's basically the standard for non-fungible items on, so unique digital assets on Ethereum. The moment you have that, your items are instantly tradable on OpenSea. So there's really, if you wanna be on OpenSea, uh, there's very little custom work that you have to do. You really just have to make sure that you comply with uh, the standard. Um, and then what that unlocks is you get all of these interesting mechanisms for buying and selling your items. So on OpenSea, when you decide to sell an item, uh, it stays in your wallet while it's on sale, um, which is nice because a lot of other mechanisms for uh, selling items, including either centralized ways or uh, escrow-based ways, actually transfer the item out of the user's account while it's on sale. So that's, um, that's the way our system works. It's, it's similar to kind of a 0x relayer. Uh, that also means that you don't have to pay gas every time you list. Um, and then you can create these eBay style auctions where you uh, set an, a minimum bid and then you sell it to the highest bidder over the course of some time duration. So this is an example of a crypto kitty where there's a buy it now price for 100 ETH, but someone made an offer of 24 ETH. We also, I'll talk about this later if we have time, but we have a uh, piece of our platform that allows you to sell initial items. So this allows you to basically sell items before they're minted and have them minted when the user actually wants to purchase the item. So that's useful for doing like crowd sales and things like that. So um, yeah, so why, like the overarching theme is basically um, you can build an NFT project without having to build a marketplace. You can sort of build your marketplace using OpenSea. Um, so the reasons you might want to do that is uh, you'll get access to all of the, the features that OpenSea has. Um, you can customize it and kind of white label it. Um, you can actually take a fee on every secondary sale that happens on your marketplace so that every time uh, something is traded on OpenSea, you actually capture some of that revenue. Um, and then, yeah, let's thing. So I'll, I'll kind of go to the docs uh, in a web browser as well, but this is just a screenshot of uh, our developer tutorial. Um, and as I said, you, it's, it's really only uh, ERC721 plus the metadata standard, which I'll, I'll talk about when I go to the tutorial. Um, uh, so we also do uh, price history of every item. So you can see how it's trended over time. We, it's, it's sort of like a very tailored ether scan specifically for NFTs. Um, you can see all of the movements of a particular asset uh, and sort of like what, what the price uh, is looking like. And then there's sort of these exploratory features as well. Um, and then here's, so the other piece of our platform is, uh, which I'll, I'll dive into a little bit, is the SDK, which allows you to build your own marketplace on your own site using the OpenSea order books and smart contracts. So basically this is a marketplace um, for a game called Ethereum, and it's entirely powered by, Ethereum, by OpenSea. So every sale that is shown on the Ethereum marketplace is also shown on the OpenSea marketplace. And when you buy something on the Ethereum marketplace, it's actually going through the uh, OpenSea's smart contracts. And then most importantly for games, uh, I alluded to this, but uh, the model is that whenever something sells on OpenSea, the original game gets a percentage of that and you can set that to be whatever you want. So you could say, oh, I'm gonna take 0% to facilitate the most trading uh, possible, or I'll take a high percent so that I capture 
uh, more revenue on every trade. So there's a game called My Crypto Heroes, um, which is out of Japan, which has been in doing this. And I think they've now earned 500 ETH uh, through the sales of their items on OpenSea. So it actually can enable uh, you know, entirely new business models where you don't have to close your economy down, but you can still benefit from the sales that happen on open marketplaces. Um, so this is an example of a pre-sale uh, item. I think I'll skip over this just because I want to get to the demo. This is the SDK. Um, and then I'll talk about the API after the demo as well. So uh, this is the OpenSea docs page. And the tutorial that I most recommend is uh, for folks who haven't um, worked with OpenSea or maybe haven't worked with ERC721 is our main OpenSea developer tutorial. And what this allows you to do is create a ERC721 contract from scratch and have it be instantly uh, tradable on the Rinkaby uh, OpenSea uh, site. So um, I'm gonna switch to the Rinkaby network. But basically this is our, our sample project. Um, it's called OpenSea Creature. And it's a very simple ERC721 asset. Um, there's a uh, link to in the docs is the repo for this. Um, and we can actually dive in and, and look at the contracts. So the creature.soul file is the ERC721 contract uh, for a creature. Um, it's, it's very simple. Uh, it, it inherits from tradable ERC721 token, which is kind of our own, um, our own uh, you know, interface contract that inherits from ERC721, but even that contract uh, doesn't have very many modifications from the Open Zeppelin contract. So you can see it's a, a pretty, it's only 82 lines of code. Um, and it really just inherits from the ERC721 full standard, which is from Open Zeppelin. Um, the most important part of this contract is really the token URI. So the token URI is uh, a way of telling exchanges and really anyone who cares about what the asset actually looks like. So with ERC721, you have, so let's take a look at one of these guys. You have the contract address, which is where the uh, ERC721 is actually deployed. So we can go and take a look at that. Um, and you'll see that this is, this is the OpenSea creature deployment here. And then you have the token ID, which is, um, I'm sorry, it's covered up by the Zoom thing, but uh, which is which is actually the the end the end part of the URL on OpenSea. In this case, it's 45. So the question is, so so that token ID 45 is a unique ERC721 asset, and so how do you get it to like display on OpenSea as you know an image of a sea creature with like a description, a name, all of that. And, and then all of these, these properties as well. And the answer is the uh, token URI. So if we go to read contract, by the way, if anyone has any questions or if I'm moving too fast, uh, feel free to let me know. Um, but we can, we can go to etherscan and we can query token ID 45 and we see that it returns this token URI, which is a URL that we can hit, and it's just a simple Heroku app actually, but um, it's a URL that returns JSON data. And in that JSON data, move this uh, over here, um, we have the name of the item, Dave Starbelly, um, which corresponds to this name here. We have the image, which corresponds to that image, um, a description, and then an external URL, which is basically where this links to. Um, and then 
so this is all actually the like this is part of the Ethereum standard for ERC721, but we've sort of popularized it a little bit because we're kind of the main uh, company that, that uses the standard. Um, but a thing that we've added to the standard is this attributes array, which is how we display these properties. So um, if you deploy an ERC721 contract and it has this attributes in the metadata, then you can um, they'll display here and you can even click these things and, sh and see all of the items that have that attribute and then they'll show up in the sidebar uh, so you can do like all the sleepy ones all the sad ones um, that type of thing all the goldfish um, and then uh, these these numeric attributes can be filtered uh, with with sliders so um, yeah, so in summary, uh, the, the main piece that you need to implement is this token URI, and then you sort of get all of this stuff for free. You get, um, you know, if you mint these items into your account, so actually I have a test account that um, has some of these in them, I believe. Um, so I go to OpenSea Creature, you, you can play around with selling them um, with all of the various auctioning mechanisms and that kind of, that just instantly happens. There's really nothing else you have to do to um, make them tradable. Um, so then uh, the other thing you might want to do with your items is uh, kind of customize the storefront for them. So uh, with the OpenSea Creatures, there's this like very simple um, uh, viewing of all the thing of all the creatures, and then there's this storefront page um, where you can kind of see a bunch of different uh, like the least expensive ones, the most valued. Nothing's on sale at the moment, but um, you can kind of browse that way. And this is actually customizable. So if you are the contract owner, so I think this account is the contract owner. You can go here. Yeah, so you can say edit storefront. And basically what this allows you to do is just customize the generic metadata about the item. So that's sort of the data that that um, shows up here, right? So about OpenSea Creature, you know, the name of your project, the, um, a link to the URL, that type of stuff. Um, and you can also set your fees here. So you can say um, that whenever someone buys this, um, or whenever, uh, sorry, whenever someone sells this, 4.75% uh, of the fee uh, will go to you. And then um, uh, the, the buyer fee is kind of like a tax on top of the item. Most, most people don't use the buyer fee, um, but it would basically be an additional fee on, that the buyer would pay. And then there's a few more customizations that you can do in terms of how the assets are displayed. So, and then uh, lastly here, you can embed this storefront in your own site, um, which a couple of projects have done. I think there was a blockchain art collective project. Um, let's see. Hello. Oh, oh yep. Yeah. Someone have a question? No, no. Um, well, I was trying to find an embedded one, but. Uh, I can't find it anymore. Um, so a few other uh, things to mention. Um, one is we we also have a tutorial. Once you finish the developer tutorial, you might be interested in checking out sort of our second tutorial, which is a crowd sale tutorial. And this allows you to do something a little more complex, but pretty interesting, which is uh, do sort of a sale of your initial items to your user base. So here you can do things like sell four uh, different um, things all in one pack, which you can do with, uh, which you can do with bundles already. Uh, so here's like a pair of bundles, but you can actually sell like a random set of items. Uh, so this is kind of interesting for card games um, where they'll dynamically generate an asset on the fly based on a random hash. Um, so things like that. And then the other thing I was going to call out was um, 
basically all of the uh, functionality that you get from OpenC once you've implemented uh, ERC721 is available in our JavaScript SDK. So this allows you to create very customized experiences around buying and selling. Um, and an example app that does this is called the ships log, um, which is here on GitHub. And this is basically just another skin for OpenSea. Um, but you can see, you know, it's displaying all the offers. You could go and make a purchase here. Uh, you can filter and things like that. Um, but, but this is a great example if you want to really like get in deep and build your own buying and selling functionality for your NFT as opposed to just leveraging the uh, raw like open CUI. And then last, before I go into questions, um, I was gonna mention the API. Uh, the API you can kind of think of as a easier way to get collectible data. Um, so say that you wanted to find out what are all the CryptoKitties, Ethereumon, Gods Unchained cards uh, in a particular account. You could query our REST API to figure that out versus having to go to every single individual uh, contract and querying it directly. Um, and the thing that it provides is we've also gone and fetched all of the metadata for every single asset. So, um, so you don't have to like kind of do all that heavy lifting. So this is used by a ton of wallets, um, pretty much like every wallet that has some sort of collectible integration uses our API because it's just really annoying to do it yourself. Uh, so that's the last thing I was going to mention. So yeah, um, any anyone have questions on specific things that I went over? I know I, I kind of talked about a lot, um, so happy to dive into any specifics. Yeah, Devin, this was great. Uh, first of all, thanks for that. Uh, you know, really, really awesome to see what, where you guys have kind of come with it. I, I know that, you know, maybe I'll, I'll kick it off. So I, I know you guys were really sort of early pioneers in, in this space and going back to sort of the, the crypto kitty days. And uh, I'm curious kind of how you see things evolving from like a consumer adoption standpoint in terms of, you know, where things were at then, like when, you know, I think I saw some stats that from the CryptoKitty site, only like 1% of people were able to even like figure out how to buy a CryptoKitty that wanted to, which was kind of mind blowing to me. And it feels yeah. like we're still kind of in the relatively early days, but I'm wondering from your perspective, like what are the main sort of pieces of infrastructure that are like uh, gonna enable or that are getting, or that need to be built in order to enable mass consumer adoption or at least kind of like early majority of people being able to acquire these assets and custody them and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I would say maybe three categories of things that need to happen and are happening. Um, one is content. So uh, there, after CryptoKitty, CryptoKitty was a very simple experience and a lot of high quality game developers saw that and said, we can make an even more interesting experience where there's actually like, more interesting things you can do with these things, uh, primarily in gaming at the moment. Um, but that's where projects like Gods Unchained, um, there was a $100 million raise from a company called Forte that is set out to do a, a blockchain game. So I think that's one, one area. Um, it's just more NFT experiments, right? The second area is sort of what I would say is like consumer facing infrastructure. So wallets um met i think part of that the reason for a steep drop off was metamask is kind of more like a developer tool than a, a consumer facing experience and so that um there's now lots of teams working on better wallets um i think openc is kind of we kind of see ourselves in the middle there where uh we're a piece of infrastructure that allows people to buy and sell these assets and the more we can create liquidity for these assets the more projects will be able to get off the ground um, faster, um, and as well as fiat onboarding. So tools like Wire that are allowing people to easily get into crypto. And then the third piece is tech scaling. So like there, there are fundamental limitations to what you can do on Ethereum. Um, so primarily folks are using it for, um, for ownership, but to do more complex things on chain, 
that's where things like side chains um, and other chains like Cosmos and, and whatnot uh, come in place. So I, I'd say those are the three things that are happening. And I would, I think they're all kind of happening right now. They're uh, on all fronts. Um, so I'm optimistic about the, I think we made a lot of progress in 2018 and we'll make more progress in 2019. Cool. Thank you. Anybody hey, Ravinch, uh, I'm here. Yes. Yeah. So, oh, Shyam here. So, uh, as we know, a lot of time Ethereum blockchain gets in a clog because of heavy volume. So, how do you cope up with this kind of problem? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing we did was we moved our order books off chain, which is really like what Zero X, the model that Zero X pioneered, which was off chain order books and on chain settlement. So, that, that definitely leads to a lot a better system for dealing with congestion um, because really we only need to submit to the chain when items are moving hands. Um, but certainly like, yeah, when we start doing even more volume and even more sales, uh, that's going to become an issue. I think we're kind of waiting for the next generation of blockchains with non-fungible tokens deployed on them um, to really like move over to another scaling solution. Um, because even if we implemented a side chain, uh, we would still need to, assuming the, the game uses the main chain for their the ownership of their items, we would still need to resolve things on the main chain. Now, if the project itself uses the side chain, then certainly we can um, deploy OpenSea on a side chain and have the assets only move ownership on the side chain. Um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty early days in, in that type of stuff. Yeah, thanks for that answer. And another question is, like, uh, how the system is comfortable with the migration? Like, let's say tomorrow it comes for EOS, EOS or Tron kind of blockchain. So how this is this whole system is more you know configurable? Like tomorrow Ethereum gets stopped or something happens to Ethereum side. So how? soon you can migrate the whole system to different kind of uh, blockchain. Yeah, well, our, I mean, the OpenSea front end and the OpenSea back end are somewhat blockchain agnostic, right? Like we store all of our data in a simple database. We're basically built, we built this kind of caching layer and these models for like what these assets should look like to a consumer as opposed to tying them like directly to Ethereum. Um, so I guess moving to something like EOS would would definitely re require some architecture changes. Um, moving to other EVM-based blockchains mm -hmm. is a lot more straightforward because um, we basically, it, you know, be using the same standards uh, and deploying the same contracts. So something like uh, Ethermint, I think, could be really interesting, which is an EVM-based uh, Cosmos chain. Um, EOS, we, yeah, we've, we've sort of started looking into, but um, I think it's, yeah, we're, we're holding, we're withholding judgment until we see how many NFT projects uh, are running there. Cause it seems to be mostly gambling projects at the moment. Cool. Yep. That's from my side. Thanks. Thanks, Devin. Sure. Anyone else have uh, some questions for Devin? We got a couple, couple more uh, minutes here. So, Anyone else has questions? Now's the time. Can I ask a question? Yep. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so uh, firstly, amazing presentation. This was, I'm really impressed by the work you're doing at OpenSea. And uh, I got to know of you guys at the time of Crypto Kitty only. And I would like your views on uh, what do you think it will be the major factor or what will propel the blockchain adoption of the people who are not uh, who are non-tech okay who are outside of the technology who don't know about blockchain much who don't know coding uh, what will get them in will it be games like crypto kitty or things stuff of this kind attractive stuff graphic stuff what what will it be yeah um well i can only i i have the most knowledge in the space we're operating in which is like NFTs and kind of crypto gaming. And I do think that there's potential for uh, crypto gaming to bring in mainstream users. Um, gaming tends to be on the forefront of new tech. I think we saw this in mobile where 
um, there were a lot of really fun games on mobile that people wanted to play and that, that led to um, people being excited about mobile. Uh, so I, I think it has the potential. I, and I, I guess the aforementioned developments in just higher quality games, better onboarding experience into crypto and sort of the next evolutions of the underlying chains, I think could potentially lead to all of that. Um, and it seems like there's a pretty strong smoke signal that um, that will happen. Uh, the other, I mean, there are definitely other contenders for like bringing blockchain to a, a larger uh, mass of people. I, I think DeFi is another interesting space to look at. Um, there's definitely a lot of activity, but similar to this space, it's confined to the early adopters at the moment. Um, but I, I, I mean, I don't think it's like a race. I, I don't see it as like, oh, gaming needs to be the thing that leads to mass adoption. I think, you know, maybe it'll be a, a bunch of different fronts where it happens. And, and a lot of these things intersect as well. So there's an interesting intersection between the NFT space where you're starting to value these assets that you own um, and the DeFi space, mm -hmm. might, for example, want to take a loan out on a piece of Decentraland that you own or something. Um, uh, so, so there's a lot of, it, it could be kind of a mixture of both. Yep, yep, yep. So maybe we'll attack it from different uh, aspects and then maybe boom, that's how we'll, it will pick up. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's from my side. Cool. So, hi, Devin. Uh, uh, I think we got, we got time for one more question. If, if anyone uh, wants to last, last forward. Yeah, I have, have one. Yeah, <laughs> we got two two yeah, people here. Maybe we'll we we'll take two quick ones. Maybe it's Devin at time. Okay, so who was it? Okay, uh, so uh, thanks for presentation, Devin. And I really like the OpenSea project here, and you presented it very well. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, as you mentioned, that there will be a database for the backend server. So my question is, it, will it be a centralized database, or you are going to use something like I, IPFS, a distributed database that that's very hard to go down? Yeah, so, well, currently, I mean, you know, it's fully deployed. Um, there's a caching layer, um, which is, it basically, you know, takes all of the, the data that's, uh, you know, the ERC-721 contract ownership mappings, all of that, and then stores it in a Postgres database to make it easier for our API, or sorry, for our back end, or front end to access it. So, like, as an example, if we go to the assets page, um, and we want to display all these things. We're not querying the blockchain directly. Um, there are a lot of projects that are building like decentralized caching layers. We think those are really interesting. Um, there's one called the graph. Um, and uh, we definitely would look into implementing them. I think we're just kind of waiting for them to be a little more mature. Um, and then in terms of where the, if, if your part of your question was maybe where the metadata for these items is stored, um, that can be, that is often stored in uh, IPFS. So if you want to create, like a lot of these art projects want to create these very immutable collectibles that will never change. In that scenario, they usually, they usually map the metadata to an IPFS URL that has the JSON about the object. Um, but a lot of games like CryptoKitties, for example, um, and most of the games have a simple server that hosts the metadata. Um, but I think as IPFS and other sort of tools become easier to use, that'll be a, a really good option. Okay, then. Uh, that's for my side. Uh, and thank you for your answer. Sure. Okay, I, think, uh, I think we have time for one last question. Ankit, did you have a question? Yeah. 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 So I had a, so I had more, I had a question about the question somewhat similar to Prashant. So, like, are you guys like, seeing some adoption from some big players in the gaming industry specifically? You know, like, like maybe reaching out to them because, like, in India, like, uh, like from on our end, like the companies here, like they are seeing what you call a lot, a lot of interest coming in from uh, big players, uh, big IT players, to you know, like, to put their system on blockchain. On blockchain. So, are you guys seeing some interest on that side? Like, has someone like reached out to you on that and that front? Like, on like how they how how the how they could incorporate OpenSea into their systems. Yeah, you're uh, the big players, right? That's what you're asking about? Yeah. Um, uh, some activity, yeah. Like, I think the big players in gaming are 
starting to get interested. A lot of them are um, in research mode and maybe waiting for the first kind of attempt at a really mainstream blockchain game. Um, mm -hmm. So I think most of the activity is from smaller gaming studios and it's, I don't, I am actually not um, like super well versed in the history of gaming, but from what I've learned, um, that's sort of how a lot of these shifts. Uh, so we've seen, we saw it with mobile where um, a lot of new companies emerged from the mobile trend and then a lot of existing companies followed and were able to, capitalize on it as well but it was, it was always the new the new companies that sort of pioneered it and took advantage of it um and some and some big businesses were built same with um the era of like facebook games so like Farmville, zynga was really born from uh from that new platform shift um, and a similar platform shift was uh, something called free to play which was basically a move away from selling your game to everyone for a fixed price and a move to allowing people to play it for free and then charging some of the power users for power up. So Fortnite was born from that. So I think similarly, we'll, we'll see new companies born from uh, this new platform, which is really about kind of openness and free market economies. But I do think that bigger companies with resources and existing IP will also be able to capitalize on it, on it as well. It'll just, it might just happen a little later, um, but we've definitely seen interest. I, I think uh, they're just a little more slow moving. I think that's a cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, guys, we're, we're just about out of time here. So I, I wanted to, uh, you know, thank Devin again for joining us. We're big, big fans of what, what you guys are working on over at OpenSea and we'll, we'll be, uh, you know, following, following it very closely and, and hopefully getting, getting our hands dirty and, and building some projects as well. So uh, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to share this with us. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. All right. Thank, thank you. Very, thank you very much. All right, guys. Thank Bye. you. Okay. Thank you all. Okay, bye.